e mi interessa in particolare fare un I would like to talk about the transformation of the memorial site that went through the building of a number of facilities. This took place in Rivesalt and this uh, also uh, poses some interesting questions to ask uh, in comparison to the situation in Fossil. Here you see two comparative pictures that give you an idea of the size of the camps. In the picture below you see on the left a Fossil camp, that's basically this area here. Here you see the uh, beginning of the Carpi, uh, the Carpi town, the town of Carpi, and above you say the uh, structure of the Rivesalp camp. And as I said before, you have this, this grid of sort of neighborhoods, uh, so 400 meters by 400 meters, more or less the size of the Fossil Lake camp. The two camps are, uh, have an element in common. I'm showing you yet additional elements, Rivesalt on the, on the right and Fossoli on the left. As I said, uh, both of them are transit camps. Both camps were used uh, also later on and both camps were abandoned. So the facilities you find there are very uh, weak, they're very frail. So what is left is just a series of untidy, disordered objects left on the floor. And in particular, I would like to highlight that one of the uh, elements that people normally do not take into account when they talk about the transformation of a site into a memorial site is the relationship that these uh, objects in the, in the foreground have with the background. In the case of Fossili, you have the structure of the agricultural uh, plains which uh, derive from the bonification, uh, from, from the reclamation of the, uh, of the plain. The picture is a picture of the 1980s, and actually you can see uh, poplar trees, Canadian poplar trees, they're typical of our lands, and they appear in all historical images of uh, the Fossoli camp, uh, also in subsequent phases. In Rivesalt, you have a similar situation, uh, although there are some differences, uh, and again you have this uh, horizontal uh, land, uh, the, the camp is uh, um, near the Pyrenees mountains and basically some elements of the landscape continue to appear and you can see that from the pictures. As regards the objects, objects are basically on the ground in a disordered way, in an untidy way. So we're not only talking about the physical remains of the sheds, but we're talking about traces, the traces of the transit of many people of many experiences. So basically they, s they sort of set the scene of the camp. And it is very interesting to point out that this dimension of setting the scene of these elements is very interesting. Yesterday we um, looked at a number of transit camps, transit places in which traces are no longer available. Of course, that poses different issues. But in this case, in the cases of Fossoli and Rivesalt, uh, you have other issues. You have the issue of how to read and interpret those traces, traces which refer to different periods and sometimes which are not understandable or wh which are difficult to read or very difficult to interpret. Let me give you just a couple of historical notes. I'm not going to go into too many details on the Rivesalt. The Rivesalt camp was founded in 1935 as a military facility for the training of colonial uh, of the colonial army, so well before the war, as happened in many other sites. Uh, from 1939 to 1940, with the invasion of France, that was abandoned because the troops uh, uh, had to go north, and the camp uh, was immediately used uh, soon after as a refugee camp uh, for those coming back uh, uh, from the Pyrenees after the end of the Spanish uh, uh, Civil War. 
So that was um, a situation which uh, uh, from a temporary situation became uh, a longer kind of confinement uh, because the government then adopted restrictive policies and started using the place as a place for the internment and detainment of people. This went from 1940, from 1942, and in those years the camp was a military facility which was very large, very broad, very complex and served as a center also for the deportations of the Jews who had in the meantime been brought to this part of France. The camp was close to the coast, was close to the railway tracks, through, from Montpellier you could go from there to Drancy. And de facto, the camp became the place where lots of convoys, from which lots of convoys departed from uh, uh, 1942. Over 2,000 Jews uh, left from here and went to Auschwitz, uh, going through Drancy. The camp was not only that, it was also a detainment center. It was uh, the place for detaining people who were not uh, liked, so to say, by the regime. There were families here, the families were separated. Here you had the mothers and the children separated from the fathers, uh, and they lived in really uh, miserable, difficult conditions. In the picture, uh, in the left bottom picture, you see members of some uh, um, charities, of some uh, charitable associations who worked in the camp to try and limit as much as possible all the problems present there. They were linked to malnutrition, to all health problems, uh, and all the problems which sometimes also led to the death of the people present there. And again, in this case too, you had this kind of overlapping of experiences. Uh, there's a nice picture of the Le Journal de, uh, de Rivesav that's in the center. Uh, uh, which means uh, our garden in K, and K was the figure, was, so to say, the, the, the letter given to one of the sheds in the camp. After the war, the camp was used uh, for the internment of uh, war prisoners and for collaborators, especially Italian and uh, German. Uh, collaborators in this up to 1948 and then the camp was uh, abandoned and later then later it was then used uh, as a vocational uh, training uh, uh, place for civilians and uh, military members of the military and then with the 1960s after the end of the Algerian war it sort of hosted the Algerians who had been part of the French army so it had become a transit place eh? and a place of, so to say, double isolation for these people, for these people who were not liked by the Algerians and who were not liked by the French. So people who, after the Algerian war, had no documents. Uh, they happened to uh, be isolated because of that. Up to 1967, up to the 1970s, more or less. Uh, this kind of situation went on up to the 1970s and, the, and then it was abandoned and then from the 1980s to 2007 the camp was used as a detention place for uh, sans papier, for migrants without documents and illegal migrants. So here you see other images of the camp. You see the comparison between uh, an air uh, photo, an air picture and a map dating back to the 1940s. Unlike uh, fossily, and here you see a first initial difference between the two, the, with the creation of the camp, uh, you basically sort of uh, cancelled, erased the pre-existing pre geometry. So basically the agricultural borders who were perimetral to the camp were eliminated and you sort of uh, uh, eliminated everything and on top of that came the camp. That's similar to Fossoli, but in the case of Fossoli you have a closer link, a closer connection with actually uh, what uh, uh, local topographies. So in this case, we basically lost this kind of relation with the territory. You simply have a big plain, 
uh, under the wind. And plus the entire area was then covered by the Mediterranean, spontaneous Mediterranean vegetation. In the bottom, you see a part that I added. This uh, emerged over the last 10 years, and that's the memorial site, which was uh, created only in one of the parts of the camp, uh, of this large plain that was used uh, as the camps. And that's some kind of an external element compared to the rest of the camp. Now, very briefly, I would like to talk about uh, the way with which we turned the Rivesalt camps uh, into a memorial site. The more attention, more focus uh, was uh, given to this uh, element in the 1990s. In 1993, the Journal de Rivesalt was uh, published. Uh, this was by Friedel Boni Reiter. She was a volunteer and she lived uh, two years in the camp. And this diary, this document, would then uh, be turned into a documentary in uh, 2007. In those same years, uh, there was a renewed attention to its memory, the memory of internment in particular. And this was a great emphasis. And this basically led to the partly spontaneous, partly organized uh, creation of a series of small memorial stones. Each of these memorial stones uh, were laid by the communities who were interned there. At the end of the 1990s, the military organization who owned, the, who owned and still owns the entire area um, was thinking about selling the entire area for commercial purposes. And as a matter of fact, a part of the camp today has been turned into um, a commercial area and an artisanal area. So at the end of the 1990s, because of this, a committee was set up to prevent this from happening. And thanks to that, thanks to this mobilizing, uh, thanks to this bottom-up mobilizing activity, the area was acquired by the government. Only part of the area was eventually uh, bought. That's the one marked in red. And this was to be used to accommodate the camp memorial site. That's a memorial site, a national memorial site devoted to forms of internment in France. The um, facilities that accommodated the Jews, especially during this, the most difficult uh, um, phases of deportation, were the three F, J, and K. Uh, quarters and underneath you see the cover of the call for proposal for the creation of the memorial site in Fossil. This was actually 20 years earlier, that was uh, dated back to 1988-1999. And that is because I would like to draw a parallel between some projects uh, that were presented both for Rivers Alp, which had a certain uh, outcome and some projects that were presented for Fossoli. A number of aspects uh, are worth analyzing here. I'm not going to show you the projects in detail because in many cases, uh, many projects uh, are uh, in a way sort of imposed uh, from above. Um, and this was kind of negative because you, as I said before, you had uh, settings in which you have traces still there, uh, untidy, uh, disordered traces, and sometimes the projects did not take these uh, uh, traces uh, into account. So the first project I am showing you is by Mauro Galantino, an Italian architect, in spite of the fact that the uh, available areas were only the ones I mentioned before, the project by this Arctic architect aimed at um, in a way changing the entire landscape. 
tutto il paesaggio co ricostruendo attraverso quei, quei segni bianchi che vedete in a way di, uh, sort of rebuilding uh, some kind of a pattern of crops of cultures uh, that did not correspond to the previous uh, agricultural crops so the reconstruction of a landscape the identification of a pattern of culture and the reconstruction of an, a landscape that uh, has uh, an importance that has a relevance in terms of memory site of remembrance site and then the identification of the area for the memorial site uh, which was left as it is today so isolating certain area to give meaning these are where the words of uh, galantino uh, Galantino also used uh, some kind of a border from the outside. So he used a number of keywords, uh, entering, seeing, crossing, uh, knowing, understanding, uh, recognizing, uh, meditating. So, so this was the, the sequence of the words he used and this was in order to depict and express remembrance. This project uh, was uh, sort of criticized by the committee, by the evaluation committee, because actually, uh, in their opinion, he would make too much reference to the to deportation, and also because the project was uh, imposed, sort of to uh, changed too much the landscape. The second project was by Dominique Perrault, the French architect Dominique Perrault. He said that he wanted to stage the traces of history, so he sort of isolated uh, the area where the camp. Uh, was lying and proposed to eliminate the vegetation and to highlight what was there so the center uh, for the memorial site in comparison and in contrast with the vegetation so he basically thought about uh, um, building the museum outside the camp, namely along this black line that you see here, which corresponds to one of the axes of this division of this uh, uh, military uh, area. So basically, uh, he would build a facility for the museum. Uh, people could go on top of this facility to see and to really understand what the shape of the camp was. The third project was by François. François instead adopted a completely different approach. He started from acknowledging what there was, what there is, and from, from the re-elaboration of the objects, of the traces. He refuses to he refused to see, he foresaw the creation of this rusty tower and on top of the tower you could see only the camp, only the camp. So the landscape for this architect had to remain a biotope. So the proposal was to uh, um, put in place a visit that uh, basically focuses on the experience that aims at re uh, at creating emotional moments the emotional moments of the experience now let me talk about three projects on fossili architect galantino in the 1980s also put forward his proposal for fossili he proposed uh, to isolate the camp again with a border so you could not access the camp and he also proposed to symbolically treat uh, the landscape a similar situation, however, with uh, more philological attention, was uh, the proposal of Ludovico Varuende Gebel Gioioso. He had been interned, uh, he went through Fossoli, and for him, the camp had to take on his role. This goes back to the attention by Perrault. I mean, the camp was supposed to philologically testify and prove uh, uh, its period, uh, I mean, the, its its function during the deportations. Then Gianluca Tura, that was also another interesting project. Uh, these were the projects which ranked uh, in the very first positions. They uh, basically obtained more or less the same ranking than uh, the winning uh, project. Gianluca Tore. 
similarly to Francois's projects before, Gianluca Torre looked for a more intimate and lighter relationship with the natural facilities, so in this case, uh, the remains of the landscape. This project is the one which won. I wanted to focus on fossils because my intention is actually to highlight a number of uh, uh, attitudes that might be useful in thinking how a memorial site can be in these situations. We all realize that uh, uh, building uh, a, um, a facility about 200 meters long uh, in a very delicate context like that of uh, Rivesalt uh, sort of uh, disrupts the spatial relations. And plus, the building, the facility was in this case partly underground. You can see how it was. Also from this picture, you can see how you can perceive it, how you can perceive that uh, facility uh, when you access the site and then actually from the from being underground uh, the facility goes up and sort of obstructs your view it blocks your view it uh, prevents you from looking uh, to the camp and to the landscape so there are a number of topics here that uh, we are dealing with so a number of formal aspects were highlighted there is great attention to the forms of space, attention to the topographic facility, to the importance of the place in terms of uh, recognizing the place uh, and from the point of view of the experience. So through topography you recognize the space. You experience that place because you are inside, in a place, in a camp in which you uh, in which certain facts took place, then the look of the spectator is basically what enables the observer to relate to the horizon, to relate to what is around. And this is something that you have in common with a part of the experience of, of the Indonesians. They had the same horizon, they had the same uh, uh, view, for example, the Pyrenees and uh, uh, the mounts that the Indonesians could see from. Uh, um, from the camp. Friede Bonireitel namely wrote before leaving the camp in 1942 that actually nothing more prevented, blocked me there. There were grey sheds without the children, they were desert. And also the surrounding hills, those hills that I had loved, uh, had become grey. The mount, the Kanigure mount, was very far away. Our backpacks were waiting for us. So I would like to close here with a double image that's uh, the image of Rives Alpe, you have this relationship between this thin horizontal line between what is left and what is behind the horizon. And that's this last image, the image of Fossoli, which poses a question to us, uh, an open question. Thank you very much.